Okay, hey everybody. As you may recall, a few weeks ago I did a top 100 most anticipated games of Essence Field 2013 countdown video, and that was in six parts, and it was a big epic doozy of an Essen preview, and I am now returning with only four days left until Essen to do a part seven. This will be the games that have either won shown up or you know my have caught my attention since I did the original top 100 so there's several new games that will be available at Essen that I'm going to mention now that will be available for purchase uh, say what they are and why I'm interested in them and then also there's a whole bunch of games that are going to be at Essen that are not purchasable but will be there in demo form so I'm also going to go through them. So first I'll talk about the addendum, the games I missed in my original top 100. If I'd known about them, they might have been, they, these likely would have been, well, it likely wouldn't have been a top 100. It would have been a top 100 and whatever. But anyway, so let's get going. Because as you can see, wait, there's more. Let's just start. These are in no particular order other than just the order I discovered them in, really. Okay, so starting off, there's uh, Limbitu or uh, Limbitu. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. And um, are you going to scroll? Yes, okay. <sighs> Always with the slow computers. Okay, now this, you know, at first glance, just looks like kind of a bog standard, you know, ancient world, armies clashing, civilizations at war kind of thing as you move your troops around and take out other troops and all that. And, and that's fine. Uh, oh, this one's at uh, the dawn of the Le Livonian Crusade in Estonia. Uh, being conquered by several different nations. You know, and that's all fine. Normally, Jen and I tend to stay away from that kind of stuff. Very rarely are we ever interested in it. Here's why this one captures my eye. Because it's cooperative, which never happens. These things are always just basically ancient war, battle, skirmish, army games. But this one's cooperative, where we're actually working together to try to um, save um, Estonia, I suppose, from all the foreign invaders. That's all I know. But that's enough, because I like the idea of the theme. It's just a game type that Jen and I never get to play because we don't want to pummel each other or beat each other over the head. But this one, we could actually work together to stave off the, the, the foreign hordes. That sounds great. I'm very, very interested in it because of that. All righty. Next up, <laughs> Scotland Yard Master. Um, and actually, I put in a, vi a picture of a YouTube video. This is actually a commercial from German television, so it's in German. But still, if you just watch this commercial, um, which, you know, it's, it's on the Geek List. The, the Geek List link is in the show notes, like always. But if you watch this commercial, it becomes immediately apparent why this is cool. Scotland Yard itself is an okay game. I can imagine it being nice for families. Jen and I tried it quite a while ago, and we thought for, for us it was just a bit too shallow and empty, and there just wasn't enough there. Even though we like the idea of it, you know, one person being the mysterious Mr. X sneaking around London while the other player play, um, is a bunch of detectives trying to find him. We just didn't think there was much meat on the bone. What this does is it adds the ability to take, well, a tablet and I hope smartphones as well, because we don't have a tablet, but we do have a smartphone. And you, and, you know, basically look at the board with, um, you know, through your device and see augmented reality stuff appear on the board. And so suddenly, you know, the, the analog board game gets melded with the digital. Um, if you're looking for Mr. X, as you look through the board at the camera, you'll see things appear that give you more information about, like, where he's recently been or he's somewhere within this area and stuff like that. It seems really cool. If you watch the video, the graphics that appear look really, really nice. And suddenly I've gone from zero interest in Scotland Yard to a huge amount of interest in Scotland Yard. Now, it could just be a gimmick. I don't know, but boy, I'm really, really excited by this, so I'm definitely going to seek this out at Essen and find out if this will work with my iPhone, seeing as how, well, not all of us have tablets, not all of us feel the need for tablets, but uh, Scotland Yard Master seems very, very cool. Can't wait to find out more. All righty. Scrolling on. Ah, Nowheresville, Bandit Paradise. As, as you can see, is it's a card game. It's set in the Old West. We're a bunch of bandits, desperados, hoodlums, rustlers, whatever you might want to call it. And, you know, that's all fine. It's a card game. you got different skills, abilities, stuff like that. You're trying to do various nefarious things. That's all cool. That's nice. But what really makes this interesting, if you look in the picture, all those red things are apparently kind of like rubber bands in that, I'm not quite sure how, but apparently you take them and stretch them and, you know, 
basically when you when you come to where you and your opponents have to do shootouts in old west style uh you actually you know your, your opponent holds up their card and you take aim with this thing and try to shoot it shoo, shoot it at their card and those are sticky so they will actually stick to the card and show where bullet holes landed and you have to physically hit your opponent you know again might just be a gimmick but it sounds like a uh, like a very very fun gimmick uh you know and maybe it's not going to be something that has legs maybe it's just like you know rampage again not that i know this for sure for rampage i suspect with rampage it'll be a neat game that'll be fun for a while but it'll kind of outstay its welcome unless you have a lot of players to play with and you know it's, it's like a big fun party atmosphere i don't know how all this will hold up but again i like that idea i like that dexterity i mean you know shooting rubber bands at each other seems really really neat that's nowhere's riddle Bandit Paradise. Okay, next up, I could not tell you how to pronounce this, um, but fortunately they translated it. The name of this one is Royal Baths Park, um, which is the summer resident of King Stanislaw. Um, and basically, it's a very, it's apparent looks like a very simple, you know, hand management card game. Uh, you're in the, the Royal Bath Park, it is a wonderful place, and the king is out going for a stroll. And we are artists, or I think like the agents of artists, and we are trying to anticipate where he's going to move and intercept him um, while he's just out walking around so that we can show him all our great works of art so that, you know, he would get interested in and become a patron. I, I don't know. I, I mean, there's almost nothing to be said about this. Apparently, um, it's you know only available in Polish. I've talked to the designer. He's working on an English translation of the rules right now. But you know, it, just looking at it, it, looks like a nice, simple, sweet little board. I really, really like the basic notion of anticipating where a guy's going to go and playing cards to cut him off of the pass and you know, be in the right place at the right time, and then you know have the right goods to sell him. Sounds like it could be a really cool idea, and I know Jen would be interested. Uh, you know, Jen being a freelance artist, um, you know, sometimes her life is like this, where she just has to find the right person at the right time and and anticipate their needs and have the right stuff on hand. So that is Royal Baths Park. Could be interesting. Okay. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce this one. Gormengast. Gormengast, the board game. This one's interesting. This has actually apparently been out for a while now, like a month or two. And almost nobody knows about it. It's like had absolutely zero advanced press. You know, the publishers, they just kind of put it out there and didn't tell anybody, didn't make a big deal about it. For the longest time, there wasn't a pager for this game on Board Game Week. Very strange. It's like, you know, they don't want our money or something like that. I only just recently found out about it, and I, do, and I still don't know very much about it. It's based on apparently some very popular series of um, gothic novels, gothic romance drama novels or something like that that apparently a lot of people love. Never heard of them. But as you can see, it's, uh, it, it, you know, from this picture, it's, there's, it's a bunch of tiles that make this big gothic manor. And apparently we're a bunch of gothic characters moving around this place dealing with you know, high drama, like you know, this card, Risky Seduction. Lady Fuchsia is a great prize if you could win her heart Leave a love letter in the nursery that plays on her romantic notions and declare your intention to meet her in a secluded location. Then you can make your seduction. So Lady Fuchsia Nursery. I mean, that, I think, right, that card and that environment right there probably gives you a pretty good idea of what this game feels like. I mean, I don't know. It might be really light. It might be one of those games that focuses more on kind of pre-scripted storytelling and less on, you know, the evolving narrative of the game. But... It looks really pretty. It's a very popular series of books. And the fact that, I mean, there's like almost like this press blackout. No, you know, the publisher just doesn't want us to know. Just makes me want to know more about it. So uh, it might be interesting to check this out at the show. Maybe finally the publisher, whoever they are, I don't even remember who they are, will want to actually try and get the word out about their game. Very strange. But anyway, that's, what was it called? Uh, uh, Gormengast, the board game. Okay. Yeah, Mervyn Peake's Extraordinary Gothic Novels. Uh, you know, apparently a very popular series of books. Not, yeah, whatever. Okay, next up, Asgard's Chosen. This is one I actually I did not put on my original list. Um, but then uh, several people point out, you know, you really, really should. You should consider this one. And then um, Joel Eddy, uh, Drive Through Review, did a video of it as well. And so, okay, I have bowed to pressure, and I have put it on the list because I admit it does seem a bit more interesting than I first thought. Originally, I dismissed it out of hand because it seemed like it was, you know, it's kind of a deck building game, um, but with a heavy emphasis on player attacking each other, which I just wasn't interested in. But then as I found out more about it, it's less about direct attack. It's more about, you know, kind of a light area control thing as you move your pawns around 
this modular expanding board and our deck building to build your right hand. What everybody says is it's it's a light version of Mage Knight. And if they had led with that, I mean, that would have pulled me in huge because, I mean, if you saw my recent video about Mage Knight, really loved the idea of it, really respected that game, but it was just way too heavy and overwrought and almost bloated in the complexity of its design, so we didn't enjoy it. But taking those ideas and putting them into a streamlined fast game, very interesting. So, Asgard's Choden, Chosen probably would have been very, very high if I'd known more about it on the original list, and it's definitely on the list now. Okie dokie. Founders of the Empire. Now, I haven't looked at this one too much. I mean, I, or I have to admit, I mean, I'm shallow. I'm drawn by the art. I really, really like the physical look of it. And apparently, it's a tile laying game. Everybody's, um, you know, kind of building and expanding their own empire and, uh, you know, placing tiles next to each other and then exploiting those tiles as, as they do so. You know, this is a, it's just a really rock solid way to go. I mean, we very much, one of our favorite games is Glenn Moore. And so this seems kind of similar to that, but with different core mechanisms for how you actually exploit your, your spaces. I also really like that this, if I recall correctly, this is the one that is about, um, was this about the, no, okay, no, never mind. It's a different one. But you know, I've actually, I have to, admit, I haven't really looked into it much more than that. I figure it's probably worth checking out at the show, though, because I just like these core elements of building your own kingdom, building it smart, so you can better, um, more effectively exploit. Oh, and I remember the one thing that's about it. I mean, you can see there's a kingdom that's starting to be built. And then you put these little chits on it that you know indicate different actions of exploit or expand or whatever. One of those chits you put on is a bridge, I think, or maybe it's a gondola or something. It's it's a transport chit that will actually make two, you know, um, will allow you to transport goods around so that if you um, you could connect this chit, which looks like it generates gold, with this chit that looks like it generates horses, and so you could skip right over this chit, or not chit, tile, that generates fish. And so you can start to develop a transport network in the the kingdom you built for yourself. Sounds very cool. Like the ideas a lot, so that's why I'm looking forward to Founders of the Empire. Okay, scrolling on, scrolling on. Ah, Kings Under the Mountain. This one was listed literally the day after I had done my first big Essen preview, and I would have definitely put it on because one, I mean, again, I'm shallow. The art looks fantastic. It looks really, really nice. This uh, very cool, cartoony. Uh, what do you call it, uh, fantasy setting. And it, it, the game itself seems pretty simple. You have a hand of cards that um, you know, are basically of the four different races, and each player represents one race of the, the dwarves or the giants or the goblins, whoever. And, but you have a hand of cards of varying values amongst all those races. And on the board, there are these mines that have varying values and, and varying difficulties. And we're all basically trying to play cards onto those mines so that we can take control of them and, and score points. But the interesting, there's a couple of interesting things. One, you can see there's an example here. People can subsequently play more and more cards on it, and a mine won't be conquered until enough cards have been played. So in this case, you know, a, a, a level 5 giant has been placed, and then a level 6 goblin has been placed. And so the interesting thing is, you know, this, th that mine requires a certain number of cards to be placed. And I think, if I recall correctly, whoever plays the final card gets to take it, but the cards have to be played in ascending value. So, if somebody starts with a high card, planning on playing more, and you don't have a high card you can follow with, then you might be screwed. But then the other interesting thing is, you've got cards for your own race and everybody else's race, too. Oh, that's what it is. You could actually, by me playing your card on there to try and build um, you know, the conquering of that mine, I might be helping you get that mine, even though I'm the one who wants it. But then when I'm not doing that, once I've conquered a mine, I have to play cards on it to actually work the mine. So I have to split my time between you know working my own mines, conquering new mines, and figuring out where, because I will have to play cards that help you, in addition to helping me, and wins the best time to do that. So overall, sounds like a very cool system with a really good look, probably a very small footprint card game. Very interesting. Kings under the mountain. Alrighty, moving on, moving on, moving on. Alrighty. Oh, and in Patch this is another one that was suggested to me. And I have to admit, I had read about it a long time ago and I'd completely forgotten about it. But then uh, somebody pointed it out, so I looked into it and apparently, this is interesting, um, oh, maybe I shouldn't even tell you guys this because I don't want to, I don't want you to know, but there's going to be a very limited, I believe there's only going to be 50 copies of this. Uh, brought all the way over from Korea, I think it is. I think this is originally either Korean or, or Japanese game, you say. I think Korean. Uh, it, was, it was a Korean developer. 
Uh, it doesn't look like it says. But anyway, brought all the way over from the Far East. Only 50 copies will be at the show, and they're first come, first serve. There is no pre-orders available. So this is probably going to be a huge run on this game. It's probably going to be gone within the first hour, and um, you're know, probably going to be one of those games that everybody, is, as soon as the doors open, they sprint uh, across the hall or the halls, to get this one because it'll be gone. And this will be the Trains. Uh, remember, Trains was uh, this same kind of similar situation in 2012, except that one did have pre-orders. This one, no pre-orders. So if you want it, get to it quick. And what is it? Well, you can kind of tell from this picture, this is a this is another, you know, lay your tiles out, but really, really cool that they come in different shapes and sizes. And so you're trying to puzzle together your 5x5 five five or your 6x6 six six or your 7x7 seven seven space and put all these different historical elements into this patchwork. That's why it's called patch history, because you're you're kind of almost making this quilt of different historical elements, and the way you put them together creates different combinations as these these tiles feed off each other. And obviously you're trying to do it at points, and you can see this, uh, this is a picture at the end of a two-player game where one person's got a really big Napoleon and can't quite make out who that person is. That, you know, and then there's like Genghis Khan and stuff. So, so apparently it's a very, very interesting game. Advanced word is it's a very cool, very unique game. And also will be in very, very high demand, very limited supply. So, I mean, I don't know if I'll be able to get a copy of this. I'm really, really interested in it. Now, I'm going to try. Um, I will, you know, elbow and push and shove people out of the way to see if I can be one of the lucky few who gets it. But anyway, that is patch history. Okay, and yeah, and now that was all the stuff I had missed before. Now, let's move on to the demos. These are not viable, but they are definitely there as playable things. And so it'd be really interesting to me. I should say one of the reasons I'm doing this video is because after I put this up, I'm going to send out an email to all my um, Rottle Runs Through backer voters so that they can actually cast a vote on what is the most important of all of these games for me to seek out. And I have to admit, I'm going to put a priority on games that are demos. Because, you know, I mean, in some cases, you know, these games are in their early stages and, you know, they're going to be a long ways off. And so I want to, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's a bit more interesting to cover a game that, you know, is six months out rather than six days out kind of a thing. But I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it goes. It's going to be up to the voters to prioritize. And this is one, one of the reasons I'm making this video for them so they can know a little bit more about it and a little bit more why I'm interested in these games. Anyway, so first up is Istanbul. And, you know, I, I have to admit, I don't really know much about this one, but it looks really, it, you know, you can see, I'm actually surprised this isn't coming out to 2014 because it's clearly got really nice polished presentation. But apparently this one, it's a, there's a, a, a 4x3 grid that represents a market in Istanbul, and we are traders, merchants, moving around this 4x3 randomly generated market with a bunch of assistants. And when we go to a place and purchase something and then move on because we want to buy low, sell high, buy it over here and then sell it over there. So we want to carry it around. I guess it's a pickup and deliver game. But the interesting thing is I need my assistants to help me with this. And I've got four assistants in addition to myself. But when I buy something um, and then you know try to take it somewhere else to sell it, I have to leave one of my assistants behind to basically do all the negotiate, you know, uh, do the financial transactions with the merchant. So over time, as I'm moving around and picking stuff up and selling it, I'm constantly losing my workforce. And so I have to plan to move around not only to get the right things at the right time, but also to re-pick up my workers. And so it becomes this kind of interesting. I'm almost building a route for myself as I go because I know where I need to go, but I know that to get there, I might have to take a side path to pick up Bob, my second assistant, who I haven't had for quite a while. That sounds very, very cool. It's a, it's a neat tension-building mechanism and a system where you know the gameplay gets built by the choices I and my opponent make. So Istanbul seems very, very cool. All right, next demoable game. Ah, Nominia, which unfortunately there's no real pictures of this. Um, but I'm really stoked about this. I have been ever since I heard about it because this is going to be another attempt at a dice builder, which is uh, this, to say taking the ideas of a deck builder game, a Dominion style deck builder game, but instead of collecting cards and building a pool of cards, you're collecting dice and building a pool of dice. You know, this has been done with Quarriers, which Jan and I tried and, you know, we didn't like. I, I know or we really did not like it at all. Um, and I know supposedly there are now a lot of new rules and new expansions that makes Quarriers really, really good, and maybe that's true, but you know, we don't have it anymore. We tried the base game that came out of the box, and we just thought it was boring and dull as dirt. 
we've also tried Lord of the Rings, a dice builder, which takes the Courier's ideas to the next level. And I thought that game was very, very cool. Really neat. But Jen didn't really like the semi-co-op nature of it. You know, it's, it's a Lord of the Rings game, and uh, she didn't really like that, hey, I might be corrupted and actually work against you sometimes and with you other times. She had a hard time with that. I really liked it. But now this one is, as far as I know, the third big attempt at dice building, which apparently does it in a very, very different way. And so I'm really stoked, really excited, cannot wait to find out more about Nomimia because a dice builder, I'm just waiting for the perfect dice builder. Maybe this is going to be the one. Okay, next one. Uh, Machina Arcana. Now, this one is a, you know, it almost kind of sounds like a, a, an Arkham Horror Light style game. You know, it's, it's a, and you know, not set in the, you know, Prohibition era noir type setting, but more kind of in an ancient Victorian setting. But it is still all about Cthulhu monsters. Players investigating, you know, traveling through a, a series of locations trying to deal with the monsters, you know, complete goals, uh, you know, complete quests, do a bunch of stuff. And you know, from this picture, you can kind of get an idea. It's, you know, got a very gothic, uh, elaborate art style that's very, very appropriate. Uh, apparently, you know, this has been demoed at a lot of shows. Uh, it's got a lot of, you know, a lot of people really, really like it. I don't know if Jen and I are going to like it, but I do know the thing that really, really interests me most about it. As you can see, this is a, it's a the the board is generated randomly with a series of tiles, big ten by ten tiles, as you're exploring, uh, as you've seen in a lot of games. But here's the thing, you know, if, if we put this tile down, and you know, and then we explore, 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 and then we come over here, and we put this tile down, and we continue to explore, 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 explore. When we get over here, we can explore further. What is this? Um, East, west, from your perspective, we can explore further. But the whole thing slides over, and that first tile goes away. This whole map is huge because it can scroll around, almost like a video, almost like the original Gauntlet. And that, uh, you know, it sounds very, very interesting to me. You know, the notion of having, having that almost kind of video game thing. Because if you're being chased by monsters, and you're just running like crazy, you can escape them by scrolling them off the side of the board. As a long time, you know, I mean, I... I I remember playing uh, Gauntlet in the arcade as a kid and I absolutely loved it. You know, there's a notion of, oh, we're being swarmed, run, run! And we can literally escape from them with a built-in mechanism that, you know, translates traditional video game tropes. Very, very cool. I really like the idea of that. The rest of the game, I don't know, but I like that idea. So I'm really curious to learn out more about Machina Arcana. Or Arcana. Alrighty. Um, uh, Puin Imperium? I'm not sure how you're supposed to pronounce this one at all, but it's a game about the economics of brewing beer and running your own brewery. Now, I should say for the record, I don't drink at all, um, not because I'm a prude or I'm stuck up or anything like that. I just I know myself and I know probably best for me not to get a taste for alcohol because I have certain impulse control issues. So I've just, I've long ago decided, you know what, I'm not really gonna, you know, maybe when I'm lying on my deathbed. I'm going to go crazy and try a little bit of everything, but in the meantime, when I can't really trust myself because I'm a bit of a compulsive person, best to stay away. So I'm not really interested in the subject matter, but still, I mean, I, I just look at the board, and I, I think that the subject matter is very, very good as grist for a strong board game theme. You know, the whole notion of, of growing crops and converting them into other things. I mean, you know, these are just bog-standard, really, really rock-solid Euro mechanisms. And you know, this is just a new way to do them. So I really like the idea of this. Would like to see more. I know for a lot of people, you know, I, mean, I know a lot of, I know people who run their own microbrews in their, in their basements and stuff like that. So I can imagine it's interesting for some people for that. Me, I just think it might be a really good, solid, economic Euro game. So we'll see. And I'm not going to try to pronounce it again because I have no idea. Hyboria. Okay. This one I'm interested in. Because it's an empire building game. As you can see, it's, it's a light civilization game plays in 90 minutes. That right there is manna from heaven. That's why I'm one of the reasons I'm really excited about nations as well. Because uh, I you know, really love the idea of civilization building games. Um, just don't always have five hours to play through the ages, as it might happen. Also, as general, we're always looking for civilization games that don't have a lot of player conflict. I don't know that this one does. I mean, it probably does. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, yeah, specialize in war, trade, movement, building, knowledge, corruption, waste, and growth. You know, all the kind of standard stuff. We'll see how heavy the war component is. I hope it's not too heavy. But the reason I'm really interested in this, though, is because this is a civilization building game that is not based on ancient real world history. Here we're building fantasy civilizations. That's very cool. I don't understand why more people haven't done that. I love the notion of all the, you know, the ideas, you know, the economic growth and expansion and, you know, civilization building, but setting it in a cool fantasy universe. That's neat. That's why I'm interested in Hyboria. I can't imagine it has any 
connection with Conan or anything like that. But still, very, very neat Hyboria. Okay, Desktopia. I don't think this one's coming out for quite a while, 2014 or something like that. Although, surprising. I mean, look at it. I mean, it, clearly, they've got their stuff together. This is also a game from Russia. This is a Russian-designed game. And it's basically a disc-clicking game with... Uh, you know, players controlling an army of discs and flicking them each other across the table. Now, a couple of years ago, we actually had, what was it, Catacombs. And we liked it a lot. Thought it was really, really neat. You know, it was, is a, uh, you know, an asymmetrical dungeon crawl disc clicker. I traded it away because at the time, we didn't have a big enough table to play it on. And so it was just, it was just too inconvenient for us to play. Now we have a really big table that I think could work really, really well. And so, we need a disc clicking game. And this one seems like it might be really cool. Normally, Jen and I don't like attacky army war games, but this one, because it's, it's as much about the dexterity and the fun factor and shooting things around, could be very, very cool. So I'm very, very stoked. Particularly, it looks really pretty. So, you know, with different abilities and stuff like that. So I would, can't wait to find out more about Desktopia. Okay. Ah, Panamax. A, a economic... Goods transport game about getting st getting ships moved through the Panama Canal. That is awesome, right there. That's all you need to say, and I am interested. I mean, but then you look at board, and that board looks gorgeous. Apparently, it's all about rolling dice that represent different actions, and then taking turns picking the the right dice to have better or worse actions of the types that you want. Dealing with the different sized ships that are trying to move through the Panama Canal. You know, dealing with the fact that it is, um, a, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a, it's a lock system. So they move in, the water levels rise and fall. I think that's the case. I think it um, deals with that. So you know, dealing with timing and all that stuff. This game I'm really, really stoked about. Uh, it was actually originally supposed to be at Essen last year, but didn't make it. And this year it'll be there, but it won't be shipping, but they will be running demos. So I'm really, really excited to learn more about Panamax. It just seems right up our alley. Okay. Ah, the perfect storm. I mentioned this in the earlier run-throughs I was doing. I'm a sucker for man against extreme nature stuff. And, I mean, there's no better example of that than the perfect storm. Not that this is tied to the movie, but it's definitely inspired by the movie and, you know, the original story, um, or, you know, the real-life story. Uh, but this is a push-your-luck, you know, a risk management game, as, you know, you, you have your ship, you, your fishing vessel, you have your crew. How far out do you go? You know the storm is coming. Do you, you know, head back to port sooner? The good stuff is further out. Your crew actually raises in experience the longer you play, so you can push them harder. Bunch of cool, good-sounding stuff going on. Very, very interested in this one. Perfect storm. Praetor. Okay. Um, da, da, da. Let's see. Which one is this? Right. Okay. Yeah. We are engineers helping to build and expand Rome itself. What was it about this that I liked? There's no pictures, unfortunately. Again, it's just going to be as a demo. Um, ba, ba, ba. Oh, oh. Um, right. Yeah. This is actually... Yeah, this is a worker placement game, whereas we're expanding the city, you know, we're placing our workers and, you know, getting the benefits of what we build and all that. But what's very interesting about this is your workforce evolves over the course of the game. They become more experienced. They become better at things, you know, so it benefits you, but they eventually get old and retire. And if, you know, if you treat your workforce well and, you know, they do make it to old age and retire, you score victory points for that. So I really, really like that, that notion kind of reminds me of Village, which is all about, well, it's kind of a work replacement game, sort of, but it's about, you know, that your workers um, age and die and all that. But that one, you know, my wife has a really hard time with Village because she gets kind of emotionally attached with the workers she's placing and she doesn't want them to die. This one isn't about them going old and dying. This is about them retiring. So I think she might enjoy this one a lot more. Anyway, very, very interesting. This one's high, high, high up because it could be a perfect fit for me and Jen. Crador. Okay, uh, Guilds of London. Why well, mention in this? Predominantly because it's from the designer of Train Game. Oh, I can't think of it. Uh, Snowdonia, which was one of our absolute favorite games that came out last year. Wonderful, wonderful game. Um, you know, indefatigably English or British, I should say. You know, set in Wales. And this one, Guilds of London, from the, you know the same British designer. Very, very excited about it. Don't know much about it. Don't need to. Uh, Guilds, or I'm sorry, uh, Snowdonia, and his previous game to that, which is, what one is it? It's uh, Paperclip Railway. We love both those games. So the designer has a kick-ass pedigree, just immediately interested. Apparently there's a whole bunch of guilds in London. It's kind of an area majority thing. You're moving your cubes around, trying to get different benefits of them. 
That's all I know. It's all I need to know. Very, very interested. We'll definitely be seeking this one out. Guilds of London. Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. In some cases, I don't know more about these, but, you know, it's not surprising me. No one's played them yet. They're just in demo form at the show. New Dawn. Know nothing about this other than it is, this, is Artipia's sequel to Among the Stars, which is a fantastic science fiction space station building game. This one apparently is a sequel that takes place, I don't know, afterwards, you know, in like this kind of ongoing saga of this science fiction universe that Artipia is generating. This is the next game in that, in that universe. I don't know what type of game it is. Apparently, we now leave our space stations and go and explore the galaxy. That'll be cool. Um, there's abandoned planets. Uh, established bases, I, I don't know, but Artipia is on fire. They seem to, they almost can't seem to fail. Every game they put out so far has been good to great, and so I'm just immediately interested in New Dawn. Okay, great museum. Um, this one, you wouldn't be able to tell from the picture because there are no pictures, unfortunately, or no, nothing really interesting. But this one looks like, well, actually this was a, in prototype form at last year's Essen. It's going to be as a demo at this year's Essen as well. So the designer's been working on it for quite a while. And it's from the designer of Great Fires of London, which I always wanted to play, but unfortunately it required a minimum of three players, so we never got a chance to play it. But I always liked the look of it. And so I'm really interested in this one too, because this seems like a very big, expansive game heavy game about running a museum and you know collecting artifacts from around the world and then you know designing a museum and designing the layout so all the right artifacts are in the right place. You know there's several games with this theme. Thieves has this theme and uh, Pergamon has this theme and we like those games. We like that theme. But those games are always from the point of view of the archaeologist who goes out into the world and finds this stuff and then you know kind of is almost a scoring mechanism. Hey, we put him in the museum. This flips the table. This is about running the museum and trying to be really, really successful at it as you know, all your agents go out into the world and find this stuff and bring it back. So I'm really, really interested in that. The best managed museum with most prestige will win the game. Great museum, sounds cool. And you know, from the look of it, from what little I have seen, it seems like a very big game. Lots of chits, lots of exploring. Waiting, can't, can't wait to find out more. Ah, Carnival Zombie. This is another one that I'm surprised is not actually at the show. It doesn't really come out until 2014. Because look at it. It looks done. But, um, okay, so this is a co-op game. It's a zombie game. Jen doesn't care about zombies. But, you know, she doesn't, she won't dismiss them out of hand. She just doesn't care about them. I like them. I mean, zombies are cool. I'm not burned out on them yet. You know, provided they do something interesting with them other than just, you know, a retread of standard zombie tropes. And this one's definitely not a retread because it is set in Venice. Uh, and the zombie apocalypse happens during a Venetian equivalent of Mardi Gras, kind of, or some kind of festival. You know those festivals where everybody walks around in the masks and stuff like that. And so a lot of the zombies are, you know, of that type. You know, they got those plague eater masks and stuff like that. And it's a cooperative game, where, as you can see in the board, in the center, that's the safe zone. And the game um, switches between day and night phase. And during the day, we move out into the city and look for stuff. But then, before time runs out, we all have to rush back home with the, with the goods we found, because at night, the zombies come, and we have to hold them off, kind of tower defense style. That sounds cool. That sounds like a really great... You know, I mean, Jen, we love co-op games, but a lot of co-op games, we end up trading away because they don't really have any kind of ebb and flow. They're just constantly ebb. They just constantly hit you and hit you and push you and punch you harder and harder and harder. Uh, like, you know, there's no better example of that than ghost stories. And Jen, she just doesn't care for that. She prefers more of the pandemic model where, hey, so now we're doing good and now we're doing bad. Now it's positive, now it's negative. She wants more of a roller coaster ride. And it looks like this is designed with that in mind. So very, very interested in Carnival Zombie. Oh, do, da, da, da. oh, C.C. Higgins Rail Pass. Look at that map. I'm, I'm afraid of that map. That thing looks crazy. I don't really know much about this, but I look at that map and I am intrigued. I am entranced. I want to know more about it because look at that. It's crazy. All those rail lines. Um, you know, and again, the description of it doesn't say much. But you know, here's the opening line, which really does get right. Basically, a roll and move game without the dice. Um, what does that mean? I don't know. I would like to find out. I'm very, very interested in it. Just, just on that presentation of that map alone. We like train games. Um, you know, we love railways of the world. It's a, it's a great theme. Hopefully, this will do something new and interesting and different with it. CC Higgins Rail Pass. So as you can see, they haven't really written much in the description yet. Okay, Intrigue City. Ah, this one. Don't know much about it. Um, yeah, hardly anything at all, really. But, and you can see, you know, there's not really that much written up about it. 
The main reason I'm interested in this is because, you know, this is kind of an area of control. There's these different guilds in this fantasy setting city. Uh, the guilds of the spider and the guilds of R and or whatever, you know, just fantasy stuff. And it's an area of control. We're trying to put our cubes on the different guilds to, you know, maintain equilibrium. Uh, we need to have whoever has exactly six on a guild is not too much power, not too little power. It's perfect. And so we are, you know, trying to maintain, you know, equilibrium and, and you know, maintain power of these different guilds. But the interesting thing is the reason I'm interested in it is because there is a voting mechanism where every round players actually vote. Where is it? D D D. For uh, two hours, two week. Uh, at the end of each round, uh, for and maintain. During the game, you vote to increase the power of each guild, which increases the point value of the equilibrium cards, affecting everyone's score. We love voting. Lancaster, absolutely fantastic. And recently, um, I played City Council, which was another game that worked fantastically with two players and supported voting to actually change the state of the game. Absolutely love that. Always going to be interested in a game that hopefully works well with two that features voting as a strong mechanism. So if, if this game works well with two, count us in. Intrigue City. Okay. Evolution Continents. Now, this is apparently a sequel to a earlier game called Evolution. I can't remember the name of the original one. Oh, it's interesting. I did help proofread the rules for the original one, the, the prequel to this, because uh, it was done by, you know, the, the publishers, they put out a link on Board Game Geek, said, hey, can anybody help us proofread our English? And, yeah, and it needed a lot of proofreading. It was very poorly written. So I spent some time helping them out with that. And, you know, from reading the rules, it sounded very, very cool. I never actually played it, but it did sound like a very, very cool game. And this one, as a sequel, seems like it builds one step further and actually adds multiple continents that players are independently evolving their different creatures on. But the core game, as I recall, was very, very cool because you know, that lizard was kind of like their their standard creature and you know it could it could grow prehensile tails and it could grow um, warm bloodedness and you know and all these different things that would change you know as he evolved his abilities in the game and you know the game was always a very very tense struggle to constantly eat and constantly evolve and now this one looks like it adds a bunch of new stuff with new continents in the ocean and all that so very very interested plus I just really like the clean um, elegant presentation of the game as well. I mean, just looking at it, it looks really, really nice. So I'm very, very interested in Evolution Continents. The ex oh, I guess it's an expansion to the base game. Ah, even more interested. Okay. Always wanted to try that. Never have tried it. Zombie 15. This one is a must check out. I, you know, again, it's funny. It's just, I think this is a third zombie game on this SN preview. And, um, you know, this one, at first glance, doesn't look like it does that much with zombies. It's modern day. Hey, look, there's a suburbia overrun by zombies, and we're just trying to survive. You can actually see in that picture, it's a tile-based thing and all that. Here's why I'm super stoked about this. This is a real-time game. This game um, seems, at first glance, to have a lot in common with Escape, Curse of the Temple, which is one of Jen's and my favorite games of last year, and one of Jen's favorite games, period. She loves that real-time... I think this one goes 15. That 15 is every game lasts 15 minutes. And you've got 15 minutes to survive and outrun, outwit, out whatever you have to do to the zombies. Uh, with a lot of tension, and but you know, with like a big, expansive board. So really, really stoked about this. You know, um, to see what it what what new that it brings, and I know Jen will be interested, even if she doesn't care about zombies, because she loves that real time, high tension excitement gameplay. All right, Zombies 15. Kyoto. This looks like a nice little card game, a set collection game, where you're actually trying to meet the energy needs of Kyoto, and you know you can do it with gas, wood, oil, or you uranium, coal, and you can see it is all about, you know, collecting the right sets. But it has a couple of interesting things about it, you know, in that you do have certain targets of what, uh, you know, how much energy you have to produce. But you have options about how to go about that. You really focus on one or the other. But if you spend more time, you can play the cards in a way face down instead of face up, which means they don't generate pollution. So you can, uh, you're, not only are you just trying to collect the right set of cards, but you're trying to play them to the table, to your sets in different ways to score more points by being less polluting. And then as well, um, what was it? The, the pollution was interesting. Right. Um, and... Right. Oh, and then there's also certain amounts of energy that you have to commit to being able to achieve. Can you meet these goals? Because if you don't, you lose points. And if you do, you make points. But then on top of that, if, if you go over the top, do you do it with more pollution or less pollution? seems like there's a surprising amount of stuff going on for a very simple little card game. Might be another one of those ones that's really, really great to you know always have on whenever you go traveling, when you're at a restaurant or something. Kyoto looks really cool. Sounds like a really interesting theme. Looking, to, looking forward to trying to see a demo of it. 
not going to try and pronounce, oh, okay, uh, uh, Paiko Jati, uh, that's my best guess, uh, Paiko Jati, let's say, and, <clears throat> but, this is a cool game, really, really interesting, this one, because uh, there was an older game, you know, must be 10 years old now, called Ket Lasers game or something like that. It's a game where you have these little laser generators and you can rotate them and shoot out literally a little laser that bounces off of mirrors. And so you're trying to make the lasers hit certain things. This is that same basic mechanism, unfortunately without the lasers, but put in a fantasy setting where there are, as you can see, there's these light generating things and you are trying to adjust them and put stuff down in the world. So you can see like there, there's a, they're putting down a mirror so that you can redirect the light as it bounces around because if the light strikes the trolls, as you can see in the picture, it turns them to stone and you score points. So Ket was just this weird abstract thing, but now they've taken that weird abstract idea and turned it into a good, solid, fun fantasy theme that instantly makes me ten times more interested. Even if they did have to lose the real lasers in the uh, process, I'm interested in this one because I like the idea of it. It sounds cool. I'm not going to pronounce it again, though. Uh, ah, all right, moving on. Okay. Ah, this one, this one, um, the laborers, middle ages, D D D, and Sultiana, and Continental Express. All three of these games were actually in my 100 countdown, so I've already talked about them in the earlier videos. The reason they moved is because apparently something went wrong in production, and the publisher Bombix recently announced that they won't be at the show after all. They, you know, whatever the shipment didn't come through or something like that, so they'll have them there in demo form, but they will not be selling them. So they've moved from sellable viable games to the demo pile. And so I've already talked about them, but in a nutshell, um, the laborers sounds cool because you have all these different laborers. They have different strengths and weaknesses. It's apparently a fairly light game, but I really like the art style, like the ideas of it. Um, Sultiana, still don't know much about this, other than it's a palace building game, tile laying palace building game. And the reason I'm really attracted is because of the art and because it looks like when you've completed building a palace, it doesn't look like just a random hodgepodge of tiles. It looks like actually something that was built with a purpose. So I think there, it might be very, very satisfying to pull that off and finish building it. And then Continental Express is another, it's a very simple card rail road building game where you're drafting the right cards to build the right railroad and score points. You know, I just like that theme. I'm sorry. I, I don't care about trains at all in real life. I've never cared about model trains, but it's amazing how board games have brought out the train geek in you. you know, mostly just because it's such a good, solid, you know, um, theme. It, I've just found games set in, in, with train-based themes just work really well for me and Jen. So, and this looks like a small, portable, you know, in a tin, love tins, train game. Unfortunately, they'll all just be there as demos. D, D, and D. I just read about this this morning. Sounds very neat. Um, you can see really nice art. This is a, you know, lay the cards out to create a random fantasy kingdom that you explore and fight monsters and collect loot. Um, I don't know what the third D is. Dungeon and Dragons and Dice, maybe? I don't know. But um, apparently, the main thing is it's a comedic fantasy world. I mean, you can just tell from that picture of that zombie eating brains and here come you know from a first person perspective it has a real cheeky sense of humor to it but what i what really caught my eye was that the characters we play are a combination of two cards you know a uh, noun and an adjective so you might end up being the sadistic clerk or the cowardly warrior or the frustrated mage or the paranoid rogue done sold i want to know more about this game just that in and of itself Makes me excited. Um, you know, it's obviously the same thing that made one of the things that makes Small World very, very cool. That you know, getting these weird, interesting combinations of traits. But in this game, you know, that finds me. I want to be a, a sadistic cleric, or a cowardly cleric, or a frustrated cleric, or a paranoid cleric. I, I want to learn more about this game and find out what does that mean for gameplay. So that sounds very, very cool. Let's see. And then this other one I just found out about this morning. Actually, oh yeah, uh, Camelot the Build. There's nothing about this. Nothing has been said. Publisher, I guess they want to play their cards close to their hand. They don't want to put up pictures. Although I'm sure pictures are coming. Like I said, this just literally went up within on Board Game Week within the last day, I think. But here's what caught my eye. Literally the first sentence. Camelot the Build is a game of medieval interior design. Okay, done. Um, rather than building the castle, uh, furnishing the castle... That sounds cool and interesting and neat. I do worry about dirty tricks and subtle ploys to challenge. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's going to be too harsh and you know hard hitting. But you know, but actually, it's the first of a series of games, the Camelot Chronicles. Hopefully, they'll all be games that really kind of focus on something other than traditional um, stuff that is 
the, the traditional Arthurian stuff. But anyway, uh, an, an interior design medieval castle game sounds cool. So that's Camelot the Build. And then this is the last one. Actually, I know I'm going to be demoing this. I've already uh, scheduled a time to meet up and do a demo for this one. It's actually um, only my second scheduled demo I know I'm doing at the show for Songs of Artha. And actually, because I am already have lined up an interview to do it, or a demo to do it, I have not looked into it much. It's a deck builder. Apparently, it's going on Kickstarter very soon, or it might already be on Kickstarter even. And it's a cooperative game. And let's see, it's deck building, although all I know is... It's deck building inspired, what they call it, deck management mechanism. Okay, fine. I don't know. The art looks nice. And quite frankly, the thing is, they just reached out and said, hey, we are going to be at Essen. Would you come look at our game? And I'm surprised more publishers don't realize this. I'm just a guy who can't say no. If people ask me, I'll generally say yes. And so few of them do. And these guys did. They seemed very nice. Uh, they're very passionate about their projects. So, yeah, sure, I'll come over and take a look at it. So um, I'm already going to be checking out, oops, sorry, Songs of Artha, which is why I don't know much about it. But anyway, that's it. That's the end. And there you go, folks. That was the update addendum to the Rotto Runs Through Essen 2013 preview. There might be a few more games that come to light over the next four days, and if they do, I'm very, very sorry. They should have put the word out sooner. Why did you wait until the last four days? Because I'm not going to do another one of these videos. Um, this is the list of games I am taking that I'm interested in the show. If you know, you should have told me about it sooner, because I'm pretty sure this is up to date. I don't think I've missed anything else of note that is of interest to me and Jen, which is always the you know the primary delimiter. So anyway, um, Rotto runs through. Backer Kickstart voters, be watching your emails because shortly after this video goes up on YouTube, you'll be getting your chance to vote on prioritizing my time. Now, there are some games I'm already lined up to do demo, like I said, Songs of Artha and, uh, and a couple others, but you guys will be voting on the games that I am going to pick, that I'm going to seek out and prioritize above all others to make sure I film at Essen 2013. Hey, well, interestingly, it's going to be, I'm, for the most part, you're going to be voting on games that I am not already getting. If it's a game I'm already picking up uh, at the show, like Glass Road or Caverna or whatnot, if I already have it lined up as pre-order I'm going to be picking up, you won't be voting on that because I want to cover games that I will not be picking up. Because the games I'm picking up, I'm just going to bring them back here to Malta and I'm going to film them anyway. I want you guys to help me pick the best games that I won't have another chance to film for the next six to eight months. Um, because I'll be filming Caverna and Suburbia Inc. expansion and all that stuff shortly after the show. Anyway, that's it. You'll, you'll find out more in the voting. If anybody else is interested, what is this voting that he speaks of? Um, basically, send me a message. I'll tell you more. Basically, for people who back me on Kickstarter and helped fund my, you know, my entire show, I give them voting rights so they get to choose what games I film, what games I buy, and stuff like that. So if you'd like to know more, contact me. I'll tell you. And otherwise, that's it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope to see some of you at Essen. Very excited and although very, very nervous because my time after Essen is just going to be booked. I'm going to be bringing back so many games, so many games to film. But it's all in good fun. These are good problems to have. So thanks for watching. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.